Good afternoon. I'm Joel Franklin. Welcome back to the JLG webcast series. Up today, ammunition words, immigration, and a harmonica, falling for new teen books. We hope you had a great summer, from favorite authors Matali Perkins and E. Lockhart, to fighting words and a magical harmonica. Our fall selections are just right for your teen readers. Today, we welcome Jody Weinheimer to our webcast series. Jody is one of our new book talkers and the sales conference coordinator here at Junior Library Guild. She and Deborah Ford have some great books to talk about for grades 6 to 12. And please join the conversation on Twitter. You can tweet us at JRLibraryGuild and use the hashtag JLGWebcast. If you have any questions or comments, you can send those in at any time via the red Q&A box. So, ammunition words. Are we talking about sticks and stones, war? Deborah, what's the scoop? Well, there's an old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Actually, nothing could be further than the truth, especially in middle school. So our first book up today is posted by John David Anderson, who is the author of last year's Seriously Big Tissue Book, Mrs. Bixby's Last Day. Yes. So this one, I know some of you who've, who've been loyal listeners, bless you, thank you. You see this is a blue book as well. Yes. But it's very, very different from Miss Bixby's Last Day. And this story, um, <clears throat> it starts off with cell phones are a bad thing, and it starts with a girl named Ruby Sandals. That's actually her name, Ruby Sandals. Some parents <laughs> just, what are they thinking? Right, Jody? <laughs> exactly. So uh, this new girl comes into town, and the next thing you know, no cell phones are allowed at school, at middle school, which is probably a good thing. Um, and so the kids just, because it's a requirement to have post-it notes, they happen to have these in their bags, and so they decide, well, we'll just pass notes, like in the old days. And so they start writing post-it notes, and it starts with these three boys who are really tight, close friends. And uh, little by little, the post-its um, turned uh, kind of spread and they start to see these post-its, and then a teacher gets involved, and the teacher wants them to write something important, something that, like a quote kind of a thing, and put it on there. But then the post-its take a bad turn, and um, and though it's not a war, the words are certainly ammunition, yeah. and feelings are hurt. And so what started off as a pretty cool thing turns a little sour. Um, this is part of our new... Uh, cat, one of our new categories called Realistic Fiction for Middle School. Um, it's a plus category, so if you already have it, then you already got your bonus books because that's what plus means. Yay. It means plus more books in the fall. And so you get two extra books instead of 12, you get 14. But in this category, you'll see um, all kinds of great books that are authentic characters, people that you might meet at your own school. Um, there's a story... Um, in this span called The Exact Location of Home about a kid who's a geocache guy, and his dad is not showing up for meetings. And so lots of kids have dads that don't show up for meetings. And um, there are stories about immigration and coming-of-age stories and stories about um, I'm up for my bar mitzvah, and how is that going to go? Because <laughs> I have a Chinese-American grandma, too. And so there's a little bit of that. So these are great books that your kids will like, even if they don't cry. Awesome. Well, my book, The Quilts of G's Bend, um, you know, since the 19th century, the women of G's Bend, it, that's a tiny, tiny little town um, in southern Alabama, actually 250 people. Left oh, wow. Texas, yeah. Um, have created these stunning quilts. So it started because generations of women would come in after working all day in the fields, and they would sing and talk and create these beautiful quilts out of all kinds of things, uh, flower sacks and clothes and any materials that they could get their hands on. Um, but I have a confession. Yes? So I didn't really have a great appreciation for quilts or quilting ah. up until I read this book. Yes. You know, I would see them at the craft fairs and all of those things, but I didn't really understand um, that it's an art form. It is. And that it carries a family's history, mm -hmm. right, from generation to generation. So let me just read you just a little bit. And it says, many britches quilts, britches, 
meaning pants. I know what britches are. Uh-huh. I'm from the South. Hold memories. Old clothes carry something with them, says Mary Lee Bendoff. You can feel the presence of the person who used to wear them. It has a spirit in them. Uh, Pretty powerful. Yes. Um, several of these quilts are now on display in museums, and they are in traveling exhibits all over the world. So if you have a chance to see them, certainly do that. Um, this is a nonfiction photo essay book. So it not only to- tells the story of G's Bend and these quilters in some phenomenal photos, um, but it also is a great makerspace companion. If you look oh. at the next slide, you'll see um, that the last few pages contain instructions on how to create the perfect quilt square, um, whether it's paper or cloth or any other sort of material. I know that students are really going to enjoy putting their stories together um, using this timeless art form. Yeah. Very cool book. It is a very cool book, and it brought back lots of family memories to me because I have two quilts that were made in my family. Oh. My dad made them with his grandma who oh. raised him. So it's got some of my papa's britches in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so our next book is in the PG Middle uh, Plus category, and this is about a little girl named Crow who doesn't know who her papa is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an orphan story. And long ago, um, when Crow was a baby, somebody tucked her into an old boat and pushed her out to sea. She washed up on a tiny island like a seed, riding the tide. It was Osh who found her and took her in, who taught her how to put down roots and thrive on both sun and rain and understand what it is to bloom. Oh, my goodness. So this is a story of Crow and how she learns to bloom. And um, as lots of kids do, as they get into their teen years, especially in an orphan story, we want to know where we came from. Well, rumor has it that Crow came from a nearby island where they sent patients with leprosy. So as Crow is growing up on this island, she only has two older people who will even talk to her, and the mailman won't even touch her because they're all afraid that she's carrying leprosy because back then nobody knew, you know, how contagious you might be. So I did a little research when I was working on the Live Binder, and I found out, yeah, there was an island up in New England kind of area, and they sent the lepers there. It was a leper colony, and they tried to um, help them as they went through this um, terrible disease. The whole families were there. Oh, my God. Um, and just recently, the island has been um, an, a, re, a, a rehabilitation center mm-hmm. for teens who have um, drug addictions, but they ran out of funding. Oh. I know. I felt really bad because it seemed like a great idea. It took them away from stuff, away from problems. Um, they're in nature. They have counselors. Um, but I put all that stuff in the live binder so you guys can – and um, see that. Well, I have an orphan story, too. Awesome. Yeah. Um, if you like Pax or The Giver, which awesome books, yes. um, you're going to love the story of nine children who live on a mysterious island. So on this island, everything seems ideal, perfect even. And um, the children have they they have their own cozy little beds, and they're never without food, and they're active all day long, and they're well cared for. There's only one thing that ever changes, and, and one day every year a boat appears on the midst of the ocean, and it carries one young child to join them, and it takes the eldest one away. Ah. Never to be seen again. They have no idea where this child goes. <laughs> so today's changing, which is what it's called, is no different. So the boat arrives, and it takes away Ginny's best friend, Dean. She's very sad about that. Yeah. And, and Dean is replaced with a little girl named S. And so um, Ginny is the new elder. So Ginny knows that her responsibility now is to teach us everything that she needs to know in order to keep the island going and keep things as they have always been. Uh, uh, but yes. Will she be ready to get in the boat and sail off into the unknown? 
Would you? I wouldn't. I don't think I would go. But what happens if she doesn't? Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. I have to read it and find out. How about that? Very yeah. Very suspenseful. It is very suspenseful. And there's a, a, it's definitely a book you might add to your book club group. Oh, yes. It's a great book club book. Yeah, because kids are going to want to talk about just what you said. Mm-hmm. Would you go? Mm-hmm. What happens if I stay? Does it make a difference? Um, so, yeah, it's a good book club discussion book, too. Yeah. On a whole different place. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad about that, actually. Yeah, we're 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 going to stop with orphans for just a few minutes. Okay. Um, and it's interesting; those both books have a boat. Yes. Boat brings a child to the. Yes. How about that? Well, there you go. Uh, Midnight at the Electric. So this is Jody Lynn Anderson. So it's a young adult book. It's in our young adult category. And this story takes place over a uh, long stretch of time, but it starts in 2065. Mm. So apparently in 2065, we can go to Mars because the main character, her name is Adri. She is a scientist, and she's been selected to just go live at Mars. And guess what? You don't get to live on Earth anymore. You're just going. Bye. See ya. Oh. But she's not really a people person, <laughs> and it's okay with her. She just wants to do her work. Um, but... She has to go to Kansas to get ready for final training to go to Mars, and they find this distant cousin of hers who apparently you live longer in 2065 because this woman is way over 100, and she's been excited about Audrey coming. But when she comes, first thing she says is, you know, I'm sure you're a nice old lady, but I'm just not really into people. And so... She is into snooping around. So the next thing you know, she's snooping around this, that, and the other thing, and she finds a journal from somebody who used to live in the house in 1934 in, oh, not Kansas, Oklahoma, And uh, but during the Dust Bowl. Oh, yeah. And so she starts reading that, and she wants to know about this story, and it turns out it's her family. And then the story goes back even further to 1919 during World War One, when – Two girls met overseas, and one of them comes to Oklahoma, has a family, yada, yada, yada. Got it. And now we have this girl going to Mars. So it's a story of all three girls and how they're all connected, and um, it's so good. It's so good. You can read it in one gulp. Yep. Read it in one gulp. You'll like it. Have you ever been to Cuba, Deb? Um, no. <laughs> I haven't either. We can go there now, you know. I went there just recently. Well, In my head. Okay. <laughs> um, the Newberry Medalist author, Catherine Patterson, Yay. writes to Terabithia. We love her. Yes, we do. Um, she has written her first middle grade novel in more than five years. Yes. And her trip to Cuba and subsequent love of Cuba and the Cuban people um, contributed to a new historical fiction book called My Brigadista Year. Um, so at just 13, a young Cuban teenager named Laura volunteers for Fidel Castro's national literacy campaign, and her parents don't want her to go. But her grandmother gives her a blessing, so she goes off into the impoverished countryside, and she's going to teach these people how to read and write. So it's 1961, and the goal of this literacy army is to teach everyone in Cuba, the entire country, and make them all literate in one year. That's That's quite the goal. That's quite the goal. So Laura, but Laura, you know, she's not only navigating a landscape that's full of war and unrest, but she also, this is a new role for females in Cuba, because up until that point, you know, they were very limited and very sheltered. Um, and so during this literacy campaign, there were more than 250,000 people that volunteered. That's amazing. It is. Almost half of which were women and young, and, and young girls. Wow. So that's, that's a huge number of people. Um, as a result of it, 700,000 people learned to read and write. And a little Yay for them! Year, Yay! Isn't that exciting? It is so exciting. Um, and Cuba's literacy rate continues to be one of the highest in the world. That's amazing. It is. So 
for uh, a reference, there's a history of Cuba that's also included in the book. But I think the real lesson of this book is the fact that this girl stepped out to be a bigger part, a part of something that was greater than herself. You know? Yeah, I agree. It's a scary thing that she did. It is. Because they were they were people who were going to kill people, the teachers. Yes. And here she is, a little 13-year-old, going away from home for the first time. Absolutely. Yep. And who knew there was even, I, I'm sorry, maybe it's because I'm so young, I didn't even know <laughs> that they did that. I did not either. Uh, but I, we did put some um, some of the literacy information in the live binder about that project. Great. But it, it's another example of what wonderful books we are getting now to tell us about our history, tell us about other people's history, to appreciate um, different cultures and the struggles that they go through, Same, all those wonderful kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of cultures and history and people that they go through, our, my next book, somebody sent me an email and asked me, did I mean for it to be in Spanish? Yes, I did. <laughs> Echo, by Pam Munoz Ryan. I tell Pam she owes me $65 and a sick day because of this book. (laughs) Because when I read the English version, it starts off as a fairy tale, for those of you who haven't read it. And it's a story about a magical harmonica. And then all of a sudden, we're in 1933 in Germany with a little boy named Friedrich who works at the Honer Harmonica Factory. And he finds this harmonica. And it's a story about he and his family and how they were uh, persecuted and had to run because they were Jewish in Germany in 1933. And so I'm reading about Friedrich's story. And his story stops, oh, I don't know, page 130, 120-something. And it's 1130 at night. And I can't, I want to read more. (laughs) But I can hardly see. It stops on page 190, and then there's this blank page, and the story is just – it stops. And you turn the page, and now it says two, and now it's 1935. And I went, oh. <coughs> I think I'm sick, and I can't go to work the next day. So I didn't go to work. I stayed home. Oh, and you I, didn't. I did. I stayed home, and I read the whole rest of the book the whole next day, and which is stupid because they pay me to read books i mean that's my job right but i wanted to read at home and i wanted to read without interruption and i did and it was awesome how she takes three people in 1933 1935 and in 1942 southern california and ties them all together with a a echo harmonica uh, magical harmonica and blends it all together it's it's just the most magical Thing. And the reason she owes me $65 is because I bought an Echo Harmonica <laughs> for $65 right here in Columbus, Ohio. Well, the next telecast, you'll have to play a little song for us. I'll, I'll practice, and yeah. I'll, I'll play a little song. Um, but this is also um, a yay because this is Spanish middle. This is the Spanish version, and people have been asking for an older Spanish category, and now we have one. So that you'll find classics like these, and you'll find brand-new stories. So, get your Spanish middle today. Awesome. Okay, well, speaking of magic, um, as a young girl, Priyanka Das, who is of Indian descent but lives in California, has questions about her heritage. And those questions are ones that her mother just does not want to answer for whatever reason. So, one day, Pri finds a Pashmina shawl, a magical shawl that whisks her away from America and takes her on a fantastical journey to understand her heritage and herself. So this is a debut graphic novel by Nidhi Shadani. She was born in Calcutta, and she grew up in suburban Southern California. So Nidhi says, My teenage understanding of India was tainted by poverty-stricken third-world imagery. How wonderful would it be if a young person learned about their culture through only positive re- representations. That's the root of Pashmina. So if you'll look on the next slide, you can see that the art of her adventures, um, especially her adventures in India, are rich in color. 
they're in stark contrast to the black and white images that are her life in Orange County. And it really kind of encourages your mind to kind of travel between the two cultures, um, kind of navigate those cultures, and, dis and, and through that, she's going to discover that she, she can be anything she wants to be. She doesn't have to be one culture or the other. She can, she can mix the two together and just be whoever she wants to be. So um, this graphic novel is for high school. And so it'll really encourage the, the most reluctant reader, I think. I think so, too. And uh, again, another immigration story, but yeah. also for everybody, because we're all trying to figure out who we are. And we don't have to be just one thing. Right. We absolutely do not have to be one thing in this book. <laughs> genuine fraud just know if you read apparently this is i'm finding a theme here if you read anything from e lockhart be prepared to want to read it immediately following the last page again um and i missed it this time just like i missed it the last time um it, here we have genuine fraud this is actually from page 11 no one knew she was an she was american that meant Noah was a cop or something. Had to be. She had set Jewel up with all that talk, the ailing father, Dickens, becoming an orphan. Noah had known exactly what to say. She had laid that bait out. My father is crazy sick. And Jewel had snapped it up, hungry. Jewel's face felt hot. She'd been lonely and weak and just bloody stupid to fall for Noah's lines. It was all a ruse, so Jewel would see Noah as a confidant, not an adversary. Jewel walked back to her room, looking as relaxed as she could. Once inside, she grabbed her valuables from the safe. She put on jeans, boots, and a T-shirt and threw as many clothes as would fit into her smallest suitcase. The rest she left behind. On the bed, she laid a $100 tip for Gloria, the maid she sometimes talked to. Then she wheeled the suitcase down the hall and tucked it next to the ice machine. Back at the poolside bar, Jewel told Donovan where the case was. She pushed a U.S. $20 bill across the counter. Asked a favor, she pushed another 20 across and gave instructions. Ooh. It starts off, and if you're paying attention, you'll catch it. It says 18 on the first page. Now, you're not giving it us the clue, are you? Are you, are you, are you, well, are you ruining the story? I'm not ruining the story. All right. But it starts off the third week in June, and then you'll just have to look at the book to see what happens <laughs> after that. For sure. Mm. Okay, so our next book is How Dare the Sunrise, Memoirs of a War Child. For Sandra Oingimana, the war-torn landscapes of the Congo were an everyday sight for her. So at 10 years old, she found herself with a gun pointed to her head. She watched as rebels gunned down her mother and her, daughter, and her six-year-old sister in a refugee camp. And this is a memoir where pretty it much is. everything else we've been talking about was not. Yes. Okay. Um, she barely escapes death herself, and she witnesses a massacre that's left 166 people dead. I know. So she says, It was light out when we found them, the sun rising slowly in a pale blue sky, casting a warm glow over the fields of sour, sorrow and grief. I remember thinking, how dare the sun rise, as if it were any other day after such a gruesome night. Isn't that true? It mm. is true. Um, it's a powerful book. It, it's an incredibly powerful book. And, and the honesty um, and sincer sincerity with which it's told, it just pulls at your heartstrings. Um, but it's not just about the sad, brutal um, aspects of her life. So we learn a lot about her life before the massacre. And she's just an ordinary kid. She has, you know, she has a family. She has friends. She has her school that she loves. Um, in Africa, and they really aren't that much different um, than the lives that most of us have experienced here in, in America. Um, we learn about Sandra's, uh, Sandra's eventual immigration to America and how she reconciles that vision of America um, and the life and how it looks like um, contrasting to what it really is for refugees here. So America on TV isn't always reality for the Americans that actually live here. 
Um, she becomes the family representative because her her parents don't speak English, and they're trying to adjust to a culture that they don't quite understand. Um, and at the same time, she just wants to have typical teenage experiences. And her mom and dad want to keep their African values. So it's a real tug of war sometimes in that family, as it is in any family that has teenagers. I should know, right? You should. Yeah. So um, it's a true testimony of, of a survivor, and and through it all, she is strong and educated, and she's a thoughtful young woman um, who we will learn eventually goes on and becomes an international activist. So it's it's just it's a wonderful book. It is a wonderful book, and I, I Jody and I were talking before we we came on the air. It's an important book, I think, for refugees and immigrants and people who already are here to see both sides. Yes. Um, that what you see on TV is not necessarily what you live, and that no matter where you come from, trying to figure out who you are is hard. It is. Especially when you're a teen. Yep. It might be harder when hard when you're 50. <laughs> you know. I'll to let f- you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Well, and our last book is very similar in the immigration piece of it because um, here we have You Bring the Distant Near, which, oh, my goodness, is a National Book Award on the National Book Award long list, um, which, by the way, eight of the ten nominees for young people are Junior Library Guild selections. Oh, yay. Yay, Susan and team. Um, you Bring the Distant Near is Matali Perkins, whom we also love. And uh, she tells the story of a family that comes from Bangladesh. Then they move to London. Then they come to New York City. And they do, much like many other teens do, they're trying to figure out who we are. And um, in this story, she learns that the color of her skin matters to other people. Um, and this is a fiction story, but I know a lot of kids probably feel the same way. And it's a story of two sisters. This is also the year of the sisters. Mm-hmm. Lots of books we have um, are sister stories. So here's another sister book. And uh, one likes to act and one likes to write. And they all have their own um, vision and direction. And they both struggle with all kinds of things that all teens struggle with. But on top of that, they have language. And they have, you know, I'm learning your language, but you, you sound white. And right. you're not white. And um, so I think lots of kids will identify with uh, with Matali's story. So good luck to her um, and her champion in it and the rest of them yeah. for the National Book Award. Yeah. And last but not least. Last but not least, kind of in the same vein, really. Um, it's The Go-Between by best-selling author Veronica Chambers and Cammy. Um, as her classmates like to call her, is the envy of every teenager in Mexico City. Her mother is a glamorous telenovela star, and her father is the go-to voiceover talent um, for films. So they, they have a fabulous life. They, hers is a world of private planes and paparazzi and all of those things that we see on TV, Kardashians and all of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when Cammie's mom gets cast, in an American sitcom, they move to L.A., and their world changes drastically. So she, um, she finds out that this new role for her mom is playing a not-so-glamorous maid. Yes. Yes. And her father is trying really hard to find work, but he's having a hard time, so he just wants to go home to Mexico City. And um, Cammie's in this new private Polestar Academy, and her new friends there just assume because of the color of her skin and because she has this cute little accent, as they like to say, um, that she's a scholarship kid, that she's the kid of a domestic. So Whoops. Yeah. So in the beginning, she's just she's playing along with the stereotypes, and she thinks this is going to be a great way to just teach them. Teach right? them. Mm-hmm. She's going to school them. Well, the more she lies the more she starts to really wonder if she's only fooling herself. So there's that struggle, again, of a person that's trying to live in two different cultures. Um, it's a coming-of-age book. It's from our PG High Plus category. It's very timely. 
um, it deals with diversity and immigration and um, and just like you just said, just the real struggle of no matter what your skin color is, of just trying to find your place in the world. So, um, you know, in addition to selecting great books, remember that we're also creating resources to help you use these books. You'll find the resources for today's and other selections in our JLG BTG Fall 2017 Live Binder. Wow, that's a mouthful. That's a, I was going to think of that. <laughs> and remember to look on the book detail pages for a link to the Live Binder resources so you don't have to know all that other stuff. You can just go right to the book detail page because everything you need um, is on our website. And did you know... Junior Library Guild members receive a discount on subscriptions to the Horn Book, Library Journal, and School Library Journal. Be sure to subscribe today. Keep up with the hot trends and the best books with your very own subscription. With endless knowledge, literally, literally, click, click, click at our fingertips, how can we find the right answers? Join our own Kaylee Hanlon on October 10th at 3 o'clock Eastern for Libraries, Architects, and Artists Getting the Facts featuring new releases from JLG's fall 2017 selections, perfect for research inspiration. Susan Gall, who's the founder of FactSite, will join Kaylee for a look at how to make the best use of online databases like FactSite. This webcast is appropriate for school and public librarians and all educators in grades 3 to 12. And if you can't make the date, then register anyway. They'll send a link to the video archive um, as soon as it's completed. Awesome. And also check our website after today's webcast for the recap blog post. You'll find a list of today's 12 books. Don't miss the links to their book detail pages and plenty of other resources. If you need credit for today's webcast, now is a good time to go ahead and click on the certificate folder and print out your certificate of attendance. Thanks again to our co-host Jody Weinheimer for spending some time with us. If you're looking for a book talker, JLG has a team that is ready to visit you. Contact your account rep for more information. And finally, thanks to you, our listeners, for supporting these authors and illustrators with your time. Ask your account rep about all of our books and categories. And after today's webcast, please stick around. We do have a short survey. Uh, thanks again for making time to give us some feedback. And finally, tomorrow you'll receive an automatic email regarding today's webcast. If you follow that link, you can watch the archived webinar and print your certificate of attendance after 10 minutes of viewing. Until next time, thanks again for joining us, and happy reading.